we'll get started with the hormone replacement and we'll do men. Um, one of the prerequisites is that we all certify that we have done our sit-ups and push-ups and squats and, and jumping jacks and gotten aerobic this morning uh, before coming to this meeting because otherwise you know we have to go back to the room and really get started in terms of our lifestyle before we talk about hormones you know but I assume everybody's done that so yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll start focusing on men we'll do hormone therapy in men and we'll subsequently do hormone therapy in women and uh, the wrap it up this morning, uh, we'll be doing the uh, diagnostics. Uh, but uh, hormone replacement and therapy in, in men has become, in, has become um, less controversial. Certainly uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was a lot of uh, controversy uh, and, and uh, there's been so much misinformation because there's been so much abuse. I mean, there's been so much uh, use of testosterone in young athletes and, and uh, hormone therapies for performance or purposes that uh, really are highly inappropriate and I think as a result of that we've gotten a bad rap in terms of uh, hormone replacement therapy in general and I think that there's such a knee-jerk reaction by the traditional medical community of which we're all part of you know but we happen I think be a little bit more open-minded but uh, there's such a reaction uh, against hormone therapy uh, just because of the abuses but to uh, extrapolate the fact that uh, it's been abused um, by physicians uh, prescribing it for their, uh, the wrong patients and patients doing it for the wrong reasons uh, doesn't mean that we should be criticizing doing it properly in the right patients where it can be uh, dramatic in terms of its healthfulness but especially when you coordinate it with uh, appropriate lifestyle as we've, uh, as we've discussed. So, yeah. so I think that it's been pretty well shown that uh, testosterone which is uh, one of many issues that we'll discuss. Uh, there's, there's really quite a symphony and cascade of, of hormones, but testosterone is the one that's highest profile right now, so we'll, we'll focus on that. And, uh, but I think it's, it's safe to say that if, if done properly, uh, uh, proper administration of testosterone will uh, decrease uh, uh, mortality over any given time period of 10 to 20 percent. Uh, certainly uh, increases quality of life when done properly. And uh, we have uh, seen that it uh, lowers the risk of disease in terms of cognitive decline, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, obviously sexual uh, issues and energy and mood. Um, uh, I think our goal with all of our preventive medicine strategies is not just improving uh, the way we feel, uh, but really um, improving the uh, uh, the duration of our quality uh, lifespan. Um, <clears throat> we, we've certainly with uh, um, modern medicine and modern pharmaceutical products we've been able to uh, extend life and life expectancy which several you know decades ago was perhaps 50, 60, now is pushing 80. Um, but the quality of life in these last 20 years in general has not been improved. We have more people in nursing homes now than ever before. Um, we have more people with chronic illnesses than ever before, uh, diabetes, heart disease, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, orthopedic issues from osteoporosis is just epidemic and interesting uh, statistic is about 75 percent or more of people in nursing homes um, are not there because of a fatal illness. They, they just have chronic decline but they do not have a fatal illness and uh, uh, this is um, to me, not a great statistic. If we live longer and have a lower quality of life, uh, it, it really makes you wonder about uh, what we're accomplishing. So the whole, the whole point of uh, appropriate preventive care is to square the curve so that we may or may not increase our life expectancy, although we very likely will, uh, but to improve quality of life and to have a very short period of disability, which is uh, uh, doable, and uh, to, to have a life span at this point, we're given current science that leads, uh, leads us to a lifespan of 100 years or beyond that um, and still have a quality of life uh, is, is not uh, you know, beyond our practical expectations. So um, we, um, we, we have the technology and the ability to do that. Okay. So the, uh, the, the testosterone uh, deficiency uh, is, is, a, is a major issue in terms of quality of life, shorter lifespan. Uh, and, and really dramatically increased cost to our healthcare system. Um, and uh, I, I think it's safe to say though that use of testosterone and other hormonal therapies in men and women 
is, is really um, uh, not going to accomplish a whole lot unless you put it together with the lifestyle issues that we've already talked about. So one of the um, issues that can happen with testosterone is related to the proper dosage. If you, if you, if you, uh, you really want to know where a man is before he starts, you want to do a very thoughtful uh, uh, decision about how much to give, uh, how frequently to give it, uh, once a week or twice a week. We, there are a variety of ways to do it, but uh, we prefer the IM route. We'll get into that. Um, but if you go too high on it, uh, you, you can have aromatization and, and you can have uh, the, uh, just the opposite effect where you, 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 the, the, the uh, testosterone is aromatized and becomes estradiol and then uh, you, you've uh, really diminished your, uh, your results. And the other variable is um, some men have, may have a higher level of sex hormone binding globulin. Uh, so if you measure total testosterone and don't measure sex hormone binding globulin and, and, and t free testosterone as a result, um, the, um, you, you may not really get the results that you need. If you have a high sex hormone binding globulin, you can have a high testosterone and a low free testosterone. So it, it's important to know the free testosterone. Total testosterone is uh, not nearly as valuable a, a, a number as the, as the um, free testosterone. Is sex hormone binding globulin, is that uh, measurable? Yes. In fact, that's how they are able to calculate the percentage of free testosterone. I don't know the biochemistry of exactly how you measure it, but it's it's uh, it, it's it's how you measure it, um, and um, you know there's a variety of globulins and proteins in the blood that so will bind it. Over. As far as I understand it, yes, um, there's a direct correlation. The higher the sex hormone binding globulin, the lower the free T. So, um, go back to the last slide. I didn't uh, see. So um, so. I think it's pretty well known what the, uh, what the secondary results are of testosterone deficiency and what has been considered to be normal as we age. Uh, and I, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, um, something we have to battle, those of us that are into preventive medicine. Um, the, the, the fact that um, we get criticized for doing something that's unnatural. Uh, uh, it's, it's been We've been told that we're doing things unnatural to raise hormone levels that are typically lowering as, as we get older, but at the same time, a heart transplant, a hip replacement, and multiple drugs, polypharmacy is, is uh, not uh, considered abnormal, so it's certainly not in our society. So it's like you know, we have to kind of, we have an obligation, I think, to, to really spread the word and, and, and to somehow um, uh, indicate that we can do things that are really quite natural. I mean, you know, bringing our hormone levels into uh, youthful levels and healthy levels where our risk of heart disease, cancer, cognitive decline, uh, the whole cascade is the lowest in our lifespan, um, to me is not unnatural. It's really returning to a, a, a state where it's really more natural, certainly more natural than invasive surgeries and, and uh, polypharmacy. So, you know, with a testosterone deficiency, Lower muscle mass, uh, medical word is sarcopenia. Uh, certainly much higher risk of osteoporosis happens in men just like in women, not, maybe not quite as rapidly, but is as much of a serious problem in as men as in women. Um, uh, decreased libido, uh, increased visceral fat, and because of the increased visceral fat, a secondary increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer. Um, one of the major preconceived uh, risks of testosterone therapy that, that now I think is gradually turning around is the, um, the, the commonly held notion that raising your testosterone is going to raise your risk of prostate cancer. And even in the urological community, I've battled this concept for uh, quite a while. It, it, it goes, uh, goes back to um, Charles Huggins, who uh, was the first man, a researcher, a physician at the University of Chicago, got the Nobel Prize in the 1940s, uh, uh, who found that men that had metastatic prostate cancer had an orchiectomy, taking their testosterone down to zero, uh, had a dramatic resolution of their prostate cancer in men that were really almost, uh, you know, 
fatally ill because of prostate cancer, metastatic disease, you know, began to flourish within a matter of weeks. So there was a really uh, clear association at that point between a low testosterone and, and improving uh, the, uh, uh, the disease process of metastatic prostate cancer. Um, and, and so that, that concept was held strong for, for many, many years uh, and, and still held strong by many physicians that don't know the current data. But in the 1980s, an interesting thing happened. Uh, there was a study done at Washington University in, in, the, in, um, in St. Louis, and they had a, a study of about 40 men that had um, prostate cancer. And the purpose of that study was to see what happened. Uh, they, they decided, the men, and these, all these men were hypogonadal. So uh, a courageous researcher uh, started giving them testosterone. And they found that in these 40 men, that 34 um, had dramatic improvement in their hypogonadal symptoms, felt better, and just, you know, just all of the parameters that we talked about improved dramatically. And six had a rac rapid activation of the prostate cancer. Um, and at that time, it was kind of like, why? You know, what, what's the difference there? And, and, it was a while before they were able to figure out the difference. Well, the difference finally, after they kind of re-looked at this data, was that the men that had rapid progression were the men that had had metastatic disease, that had had an orchiectomy, and had had their testosterone taken down to zero. Uh, the, all the other men um, had prostate cancer and had been treated, but their baseline testosterone was maybe 200, 300, 400, you know, it was above that unicoid level. Um, and so this uh, then added some light to it, and, and that light became brighter, uh, really, with the research of Abe Morgenthaler at Harvard, who, who then um, started studying this in, in further detail. Uh, he had a, uh, uh, a patient who was an attorney uh, who came to him, and, and he was, had prostate cancer, was under active surveillance. Uh, and was hypogonadal, and, and he uh, um, insisted on getting some testosterone. And most all urologists in the country, or any physician in the country, would say, you know, no way, you know. And, and, and Abe Morgenthaler, um, I guess I'm sure he had pages and pages and informed consent to have signed by the lawyer about what he was doing and how this is likely going to kill him, but he put him on testosterone, and his PSA got better, and his, all his hypogonadal symptoms went away. And, and he had no activation of his prostate cancer. In fact, his prostate cancer was uh, uh, totally dormant at that, at that point. So this was felt to be anecdotal and coincidental and, you know, almost meaningless because it was a, you know, N of one. But he started doing a more detailed study. Now he had, he had like, you know, 10, 20 men, it's gone on for now for several years, but you know, it, there were a, quite a group of men that were, all of whom had prostate cancer, but about half of the group were, half of the group was put on testosterone, half of the group was not, and he found that the men that were put on testosterone did not have a more rapid progression of the prostate cancer. In fact, a few had less rapid progression of the prostate cancer. These were all being watched in terms of watchful waiting, so some did progress in both um, uh, groups. And the ones that did progress would then have definitive therapy. Uh, but he, uh, he documented quite well, and his study continues to go on, and the number is getting higher and higher in terms of the men in this study. But there's clear evidence that uh, the, these men um, are not progressing more rapidly. They're taking testosterone, and they're healthier, and they have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease, and a better mood, and, and all of our other life parameters are, are better. Uh, so he is now making the case that men that have prostate cancer are being protected because of the testosterone. Um, this was all kind of mysterious still in terms of what's going on here because, you know, some people are, will progress. And, and then he came up with the saturation principle of, of prostate, uh, the testosterone receptors in the prostate. And it, 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 it was determined, he determined that if you're, Baseline testosterone is above 90 nanograms per dl. Your prostate, your testosterone receptor cells in the prostate are, are saturated. So you can go from zero to 90 in like the fire. You can go from 90 to 1,000 
and nothing happens because you're, you're maximally stimulated at that very low level of 90 to 100 nanograms per dl, uh, total testosterone. So this really, I think, has, has become the principle of, of how you can decide who it's appropriate to give testosterone to, who it's safe to, because if a man's had an orchiectomy, have been on lupron, and, or had metastatic disease, you don't want to go there, and, and these are the guys you want to stay away from. But if a man has a baseline testosterone over 100 nanograms per DL, or to be safe, maybe call it 150 or 200, which is many, you know, many men will find in that category, I, it, it, you can safely give them testosterone. Um, and once again, I tell all these guys uh, that their risk of progression is perhaps 10 percent, 15 percent, you know, it depends on their risk factor. Um, and they need to continue to be followed very carefully and have prostate examinations and PSAs at least two, three times a year. Uh, but uh, I think we can safely uh, say that uh, their risk of progression is not going to be higher than the man that has not, you know, taken testosterone. So, right. And, and, and along the same lines, just kind of common sense wise, I think it's, uh, it's clear that uh, the older we get, the lower our testosterone gets. The older we get, the higher our risk of prostate cancer. So there's an inverse relationship between testosterone and prostate cancer. And, and that's um, something that you, you start to realize in, in, as you look at the data, uh, that, 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 that simply the, 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 the relationship of testosterone causing prostate cancer uh, becomes a very flawed concept. Uh, I think, you know, we've kind of talked about this um, a lot, but uh, the basis of all of our hormonal therapies in all of our patients, including ourselves, should be don't bother unless you're doing the right nutrition, the right exercise, the right lifestyle. So that's, uh, that, that's critical, and we've talked about that uh, a lot. So, okay. Um, erectile dysfunction, I, I think that uh, it's, uh, it's an, an important relationship with, uh, with testosterone. Um, but I think that we've seen that erectile dysfunction is a barometer of overall health. It's not just hormonal. Uh, testosterone is, is part of the equation, but uh, when we start, and we as urologists look at this in a fairly complex way in terms of the multi-nature etiology of it, uh, erectile dysfunction can be related to obviously hormone deficiency, but it can also be related to vascular insufficiency. It can be related to neurological disease. It can be related to uh, emotional issues and depression and anxiety. Um, so erectile dysfunction is, uh, once again, a, a, a great barometer of overall health. Uh, but um, uh, you, you really want to look at the big picture. So uh, this is, is kind of uh, the same principle of all of our patients if we're, when we're dealing with hormonal issues. Uh, we want to look at the big picture, and, and that's, that's the mistake that we see with all these hormone clinics around. I mean, they're, they're just not even going there, and that's the major obligation that I think we have and where I think with Previent and those of us that are, I think, enlightened about this sort of thing, you know, we are doing people and, and the medical world a big favor by insisting that hormone therapy be uh, coordinated with a good medical evaluation. If somebody has erectile dysfunction, you correct their hormones, they're still having problems, look for vascular disease. If you don't find vascular disease, look for neurological disease. Uh, uh, if none of those are a factor, you start looking at uh, stress issues and they can be major, major factors. Yes? When you get a patient with ED, do you follow up and work up all these issues with them? Well. Uh, not necessarily. I, I think that it really depends upon um, the individual. I mean, I'll go as far as it's needed to, to correct it. And, and some people will simply fail. And those are the men that, um, you know, you can do, uh, I mean, obviously the PDE5 inhibitors are, there's no reason not to try that right away. You know, I mean, the Tadalafil and Sildenafil are great drugs and cardioprotective and brain protective and, you know, microvascular, dil you know, microvascular dilatory effect. So, just try that right away. Now, if that works, then you're done. You know, you don't need to do anything else. Although, if somebody's hypogonadal, then you know you go that route. But if somebody has a risk of vascular disease, you put them on, you know, Tadalafil daily or Sildenafil on demand, and and um, and they're not making progress. Uh, 
uh, and, and you've corrected their hormones and you definitely want to look for vascular issues and get a vascular workup. Um, VO2 max is a good screening procedure for that sort of thing, but uh, you know, I would refer them to a cardiologist and, and, and get a workup for that. Um, and, and you go down the, you, you just go as far as you need to before you, you know, before they get success. Uh, and if, if, if everything, uh, if they still fail, most men will not fail. Eventually you're gonna you make, get some sort of progress. I mean, I would vast, say the vast majority of men, um, if you get their hormones corrected, and, and, and unless they have some other major diseases, and you put them on a PDE5 inhibitor, uh, what I, my, my practice, I would do a, a daily dose of Tadalafil one way or another, um, and if needed, uh, 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 Sildenafil on demand. It works great, and, and there's no reason not to, other than the cost is ridiculously you know, ex prohibitive with the, with the market drugs, but you can compound these things and do a sublingual uh, troche of Tadalafil and Sildenafil, which costs 20% of the price of, of, uh, of you know, the, the product of uh, you know, Tadalafil and Sildenafil on the market, you know, Viagra and Cialis. It's, it's, uh, you you're, seem surprised. Have, you, have we not talked about that? Okay. We can compound it and we can talk with uh, what we can do in our pharmacies about that. But uh, um, Tadalafil um, uh, is basically the active product in Cialis and uh, the compounding pharmacies uh, uh, can't do the same product that is marketed, uh, but they can do a sublingual troche. Uh, and uh, the, the, it's much, much less expensive. And if you can get this stuff covered by insurance, that's great, but it's, it's pretty challenging many times to do so. Um, so you can, you can create a sublingual troche of Tadalafil uh, that's actually a 40 milligram troche, you divide it in quarters, you get 10 milligrams, twice the dosage of the daily dose Cialis, which is about $300 a month for two or three dollars a day, which would be what, $90 a month, uh, you can have double the dose. So if somebody responds very nicely to that, you could do 10 milligrams every other day. Um, $45 a month instead of $300 a month if, if you're talking the same dosages. So that, that works great, it really does. Plus, the advantage of the sublingual of the Tadalafil, uh, you'll get a blood level in a matter, you know, probably an hour rather than, the, you know, more, Tadalafil more like two or three hours. And, and there's, a, there's a buildup over, a, you know, it's a half-life of 18 hours. So there's a buildup over a period of days as you take it. So uh, I think there's advantages. The only disadvantage is it has to be kept cool. So if you travel, you have to keep it in some sort of cooling pack, which is still not difficult to do because you can purchase these uh, uh, products uh, that are used for protecting insulin and they can be in a small packet and just carry it with you when you travel. Um, so that works and this, you know, the sildenafil the same way. Um, you get 100 milligram trochies of that, divide it in half, you know, it costs $5 rather than $40, you know, and, and it works the same and it works faster. It's just that you have to keep it cool, so you can't put it in your pocket because it'll melt. So you know that's that's the good news and the bad news. You know? so. Um, so I think that you know I think the 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 bottom line here is that there's many factors going on, and if it gets uh, complex and if they're not making progress with hormone optimization and with uh, uh, with the PDE5 inhibitors, get a urologist involved and. Uh, there's other things you can do. The vacuum devices are helpful. The penile injections of, uh, of the prostaglandin and phentalamine uh, uh, can, can be uh, quite helpful, and, and we do that a lot. Uh, we, you may or may not want to do that yourselves. Uh, you know, as a urologist, we, we do that a fair amount. Um, the only problem is that you have to realize and be prepared for that perhaps 1% risk of uh, priapism. And priapism is not a happy condition, and, and uh, if you get an, a lasting erection, you know, you want to immediately inject these guys with uh, uh, some sort of um, uh, vasoconstrictor. Um, and, and, and then you can, most of the time, get it to resolve. But this is a urological emergency, so just beware. You know, when somebody's uh, going the injection route, uh, the risks are very low, and the success is very high, and it works great. Um, but, um, you know, you have to treat this with a lot of respect. So I would be inclined to, uh, if you're going to do it, you know, do it with a, a urologist involved. So, all right. Um, I think that uh, 
there's there's a sense that uh, testosterone is is uh, mostly to be used for sexual issues, but that's really uh, um, not the case. I mean, obviously, it does help with sexual issues, but I, I think that uh, the, uh, the the pre the, the what's really not recognized is that it's probably at least as helpful in terms of uh, cardiovascular protection and cognitive protection. Um, the 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 effects of of hormone optimization on mood and, and uh, cognition, um, in my observation, and I've not seen a lot of published data about this, but in my observation, the, the results are, are dramatic. I mean, I, I see, obviously combined with exercise and nutrition, but certainly taking it to a new level of dramatic results. The, the, what I've seen in younger people and in elderly people, uh, that their cognitive function, of which you guys did the other day as a baseline, yesterday as a baseline, gets better and better and better year by year when we do these uh, serial evaluations of their cognitive function, their executive function, their recall, their short-term memory, their long-term memory, their, you know, the mental gymnastics that indicates neuroplasticity um, keeps getting better and it's, it's a consistent finding. You know, the, the most dramatic finding for me which got my attention was this older guy who was 88 when I first got started, the oldest patient I've ever gotten involved with this sort of thing, who's now 94 and I think we talked about that. Uh, yesterday, but um, you know, his cognition went from reasonably good to magnificent, one of the best I've seen. And he just happened to be 94 years old, probably better than most 20 year olds. So it's not a matter of intelligence, not a matter of experience, it's a matter of your ability to have mental gymnastics and neuroplasticity. Uh, and and um, you know, the fact that we uh, assume that we need to get these senior moments and that we need to be, uh, you know, losing our recall and and not have the uh, dexterity mentally to do these things as we get older is really not the case because you, 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 can, you can really be very protective of that and obviously the cardiovascular issue is, is, is the same, so Paul. One of the biggest things I've noticed in my patients is the, the mood improvement and that is the one thing of all the other things that seems to be most important to them because, and their families. Right, I, I agree with that. And, and, and mood and cognition may go to a degree hand in hand, but mood is something that, I mean, people don't necessarily feel their reaction time or they feel their memory, but they certainly feel their mood. Uh, I've had numerous patients that say that as they got older, they got more of a depressive feeling and didn't have energy and didn't have you know, it didn't have the spark and the joy de vie. And, and um, m multiple patients have said the cloud is lifted and that it's, they're not taking antidepressants. Or if they were taking antidepressants that had side effects that they didn't like, they don't need them. And they just simply feel positive and optimistic and enthusiastic. And, and, and this, this, this is kind of difficult to measure, but when, when they feel this way, it's, it's night and day. I, I've, I've had numerous testimonials to me of patients that just say, you know, I've never, and I feel that myself, I've never felt, I've never, I'm older, but I've never felt better in my life. I'm, my mood is great. I see others that just continually say the same thing. It's just, it really makes a big, big difference. Obviously, if you do the nutrition exercise, the lifestyle, I mean, if you're trashing yourself, it's not gonna make that much difference, but uh, in general. That was the, the whole idea behind grumpy old men was that it was low T because their mood was grumpy. Well, they used that in the ads, I think. Yeah, right. I think that was an Androgel ad, or I don't know which, but there was, there was definitely, that was, that we got some mileage out of that one. So, therapeutic options, and, and there's a lot of things that are marketed as, as, as being options. Uh, oral uh, is uh, something that we as urologists used to use a drug called halitestin. We give 10 milligrams, and uh, this goes way back. And, um, um, it maybe, you know, raised your testosterone a little bit, but uh, it was uh, really uh, um, caused a lot of liver dysfunction and, and uh, side effects and not all that effective. So we've gotten away from that entirely in men um, because the toxicity in the, uh, uh, was, was high and the efficacy was low. Now in women, that may be a little different situation. Um, uh, I don't use it that much in women, but you could make a case for some oral use in women and there's these lymphatic absorption sublingual products that we've uh, 
talked about a little bit in some of the pharmacies that we've uh, you know been uh, discussing. I have have some of these uh, uh, lymphatic absorption sublingual products available that we may use. They could work quite fine with women, but because of the very low dosage, they tend not to get liver toxicity. Uh, because it's lymphatic absorption, they tend not, it doesn't, it's not uh, metabolized through the liver. So that may be a reasonable thing in women, but not in men because the dosage obviously is substantially higher. Uh, transdermal creams is probably the most common way that this is uh, utilized now across the board in this country. Um, and Androgel, Axeron, uh, uh, and uh, Testim. Uh, and these are reasonably effective. I've used this on my patients and, uh, um, you know, before I got involved with, uh, you know, the, the injection therapies. And it helps to a degree. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the drug companies that promote it talk about the fact that, you know, they get within normal ranges of testosterone in about 80% of situations, but then you get into the definition of normal, you know, or improved. Uh, you know, so I, what, in my experience with the, with the, with the, with the topicals, the androgels, uh, uh, axerons, um, I'd say on an average I can get a total testosterone of maybe 600, maybe 700 if you're really <coughs> generous with the amount that you use. Um, free testosterone maybe in that 100, 120 range, uh, you know, it, it really depends. But there's a couple problems with this beyond the fact that it's prohibitively expensive and, and, and the, you, know, you re generally don't get insurance coverage until you have a, a, total, testo a total testosterone below by 200. But by that time, you know, you're, you're really off the cliff. You feel awful. Uh, and most men just don't feel whether it's, you know, they, they feel better at more like 800, 900, that top quartile of what would be considered normal. So that's one issue in terms of the cost. And the other issue is, uh, is the fact that with topicals you get a dramatic rise in dihydrotestosterone. And this is a so-called bad testosterone, which uh, can be associated with prostate stimulation, benign prostate stimulation, not malignant stimulation, but theoretically could, you know, raise the prostate volume by, you know, 10 or 15 percent, <laughs> may or may not affect prostate symptoms. But the other thing that's probably more of a concern as men is that with a high DHT, there's a higher risk of hair thinning and hair loss. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, the, that's, a, that's a concern. And so I, I shy away from the transdermals uh, because you really can't get to the levels that I think are really going to be therapeutic and stay there and have it be cost effective. And uh, the, the DHT rise, uh, dihydrotestosterone, is, is a concern. Pellets, actively promoted. You've all, I think, probably seen the promotions in the companies that are, that are promoting that. Um, and pellets can get to a reasonable level, probably better than the uh, uh, transdermals. Uh, and they promote it once again that you'll stay in a normal range, be three months, four months, occasionally five months. Uh, the only problem, once again, is that the definition of the normal range, and, and you really don't have control over where you are week to week or month by month. And what tends to happen uh, is that you will crash the, 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 the uh, uh, the testosterone level drops dramatically and then they'll reinsert another pellet. It's an office visit, <coughs> relatively expensive by some of these, uh, the commercial outfits that do the pellets. And I just don't like living on the edge of, well, when, you know, it's been three months, when am I going to crash, you know, and then I need to get in there right away. So I just, I, I shy away from that. Uh, patches, we used to use a, but, but pellets are still a reasonable option. You know, I, I don't want to say that they're not. They may be a reasonable option for some man who's not willing to do his own injection and is, you know, willing to understand that, 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 that he will know it when, it when it's down and he's going to want to get one right away again. Um, patches, reasonable, uh, but once again, um, unpredictable absorption and, and uh, have really become a little less uh, uh, um, popular. It's uh, another form of a topical. Um, but I've, I've not seen that we get levels that are really adequate uh, for, for good therapy. So it brings us down to the intramuscular injections, which, uh, you know, at first uh, glance, um, men are, uh, you know, hesitant to do an injection. You go to a doctor's office and typically what's done is they will do an injection of a high dose of testosterone and say, come back in a month. Um, and I've seen internists do this, I've seen urologists do this, and that's how they treat hypogonadal men. And then these guys feel like Superman for two weeks, and then they feel kind of 
balanced for maybe one week and then they feel like they've totally crashed for another week and they get in, I gotta get in right away because I feel awful. So I go through this roller cycle, you know, this, this, this uh, you know, roller cycle imbalance of too high, too low, and, and I just, I don't like that. Uh, so what we recommend is um, uh, injection, self-injection, teaching a man to inject himself, which is so easy to do. I mean, why urologists and internists you know, are not willing to do that, I think is just not comfortable with it themselves. Um, but the reality is you can teach somebody to do this, not two minutes, it's, it's nothing. Uh, just show them how to, uh, you know, drop the product, put in a larger needle to draw it up, a smaller needle to inject, um, inject it in their buttocks or anterior thigh. It, it's just really very, very simple to do. Um, and once a week generally works fine for most men, 100 milligrams or a little less, a little more, depending upon their baseline testosterone and depending upon where they are the level-wise a couple months later, so you want to measure this. Um, and, and that works well. Now, some men may feel a little bit better the first part of the week and a little less uh, vigorous the last part of the week, and then I would do a half dose twice a week. And many men can kind of make that decision about whether they want to do it once a week or twice a week. Uh, but it works fine, and it, it's, uh, you, you, you generally don't feel it uh, if you go into the muscle. The, the only time that there's a problem would be if uh, men um, are not getting into the muscle, they do it subcutaneously, and you get a little lump under the skin. The, the, the sensation is in the skin, it's not in the muscle. So if you get a good deep injection with a one-inch needle, many times you won't feel anything. Um, and, and men just have to be taught to do that, but I do that in the office, and. You know, we draw it up together and I say, okay, you know, just put your hand on your butt and, and just get it all the way in. And, and they're all paranoid about doing that. And once they do it, they say, well, I, I barely even felt it. Uh, and that's typically what happens, you know. So rarely will I find anybody that can't do that. Maybe in my practice, I may have two I do have two people. Uh, that's it, you know, and, and that, that just have kind of a psychological adherent, uh, you know, you know, you know, paranoia about doing it themselves, but, but the vast majority of men, and certainly 99% literally, um, have no problem with that. So I, it, it, it doesn't cost much. I mean, it's, 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 it's inexpensive, it's much more effective, and um, I think much safer because, you know, if you get too high, you can just lower the dosage, you can skip a week. Uh, if it's too low, you can adjust it, you know, very quickly, and, and you can know it by the, the lab work, you know it by the, hey, how they feel, um, you know, I. I uh, like to make sure people aren't um, making the mistake of thinking that, you know, if 100 milligrams is good, then 200 milligrams is twice as good. That's a mistake because uh, that's absolutely the wrong idea because you, you overdose, you go too high on this stuff, and then your estradiol goes up, your DHT goes up, and, and you don't get the positive results that you otherwise would get. So it's very, very important to monitor dosages and to monitor how these guys are feeling. On rare occasions, some men will get overly aggressive. Uh, I've not seen that happen much at all. Um, sometimes it could be because the level's a little bit too high, but it's important to talk with these guys on a regular basis and just how do you feel. Uh, most men should feel just fine, not overly stimulated. Uh, generally testosterone, you don't, you don't feel it. it you know, it's it just, it, it just something that allows you to get the better results of uh, your lifestyle. Yes. Ken, a couple questions. How do you determine uh, what dose you start with and when do you measure your repeat blow work and what's your target with the repeat blow work? Great questions. Um, the, uh, the initial dosage uh, depends upon their level. Uh, if, uh, uh, say somebody comes in, and, and you know, it depends on their, you know, their, how big they are. You know, they're, they're, People that are a smaller frame, I would probably give a little lower dosage because it's you know the, the the your serum level is going to be based on your weight to a degree, and your body volume. And your, you know, but uh, on an average, say you know a 170 pound man, 180 pound man, um, if his free testosterone is 60 or 70, and total is maybe 300, 350, 400. You know, that's kind of the tip of the most common situation that we'll see. I'll I'll do. A, a, 100 milligrams, which is, you know, it'll be a, the, the vial, what I usually do is a 5 cc vial, it's 200 milligrams per cc, 0.5 cc is gonna be 100 milligrams, and I would have them do that just once a week. 
and, and I do the first injection in the office with them together, and then they're generally they're off and running. Then, so I'll do that, and, and then I will uh, um, do a um, probably free and total testosterone, probably a CBC, because some of these guys will get an erythrocytosis. I, I would probably do that eight weeks later. Um, and um, whether you want to repeat any other labs depends upon the situation. If their lipid profile has been off, you may find that their triglycerides and, HD, and LDL have gone down and HDL may be going up if they're doing you know, exercise and reasonable nutrition. Uh, but um, you know, that would be my average timeline. What's your goal for a free testosterone? Free testosterone, um, I would like to see it probably in the range of 200 uh, nanograms per DL. Um, uh, but anywhere between, say, 150 and 240, 250 is probably reasonable. Um, you tend not to get uh, a, too much of a rise in DHT, not some rise, but not that much. You tend not to get too much of a rise in estradiol. Once again, somewhat, but not too much. You want a reasonable balance. And um, so I'll, I'll titrate the doses, and based on that, I mean, I'll have some men that will do up to like 0.8 cc's once a week. It's a little high for most guys because generally their free tea will creep up and, you know, 300, 350. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, you know, we're going to want to be careful that the DHT and estradiol don't go up at the same time because once again that, you know, has an opposite effect. Well, with that being said, the what DHT level do we actually titrate down? Well, if you're a, if you're a um, hair doctor, they want your DHT at you know five. You know, the problem with the low DHT and the uh, finasteride and the DHT blockers, which is easy to bring the DHT down. I mean, you, you can bring it way down with, you know, finasteride. It, it, you know, it's the Propecia, which is one milligram a day for hair protection, uh, or uh, uh, Proscar, which is five milligrams of finasteride, which the urologists use, but they, they have uh, major side effects sexually and energy-wise and mood-wise. So uh, DHT is a powerful androgen. And, and it's not a bad antigen unless it gets too high. So where would I like to see it? I don't mind a DHT that's 50, 60, 70, uh, maybe a little higher. Uh, but, um, you know, it depends to a certain extent on, on the man. If, if he's, you know, if he's uh, concerned about the hair thinning and is that a hair transplant and, you know, the, 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 the guy that's involved with this hair therapy, uh, you know, wants to uh, drive his DHT down to, five because it probably is hair protective at that level. I, I usually kind of compromise, you know, maybe get the DHT down to 30, 35, or something like that. I, so I, I, that has to be individualized, you know. Gordon wrote in his book that he's actually against Propecia finasteride because he feels that, because DHT is actually very important in the brain. I agree, I agree, and I, I think that it's a, it's a matter of degree, and, and, and I think that uh, I, I lobby against you know, I, I see men come up with a DHT of 10 or 15 and they're on Propecia and because, you know, my doctor said I needed to protect my hair. Um, how do you feel? Well, I, I feel okay. I mean, I may have a little decreased energy and my sex life isn't great. And I said, well, why don't you do it once a week instead of once a day? Um, that's usually enough to bring it down and you know, keep it down in reasonable levels without the side effects. So, um, you know, it, it, like anything else, there's a trade-off and, and uh, you have to balance it out. But uh, Personally, I'd rather have more energy, more libido, and maybe a little less hair, you know, than the other way around. Uh, so, is your repeat blood work? Does it include? Do you even bother getting a total? Um, you have to get the total to get the free, you know, because, you know, it, it's it's part of the equation. I think that <coughs> I, I don't know the biochemistry behind all the lab work and all. But your focus on this is different from the bio T. Um, he, Dr. Gary Domitz has said he dumbs it down for us. So. He, it's to, he focuses on the total, and then all my rings is it's all about the free. So um, it's a different concept. Yeah, I, you know, if you focus on the total, I mean, I've seen men with a total testosterone of a thousand, and their free T may be ninety, and I've seen people with a total testosterone of a thousand, and their free T may be two hundred and fifty. You know, and yeah. um, it's related to sex hormone binding globulin, and and uh, you know, if 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 you got a high sex hormone binding globulin, you know, it renders much of that free T inactive, and so it's not going to do anything. There's no way to manipulate the sex hormone binding globulin. Well, maybe. You know, good lifestyle obviously will bring it down to a degree. 
there's some positive thing about sex hormone binding globulin. I, once again, don't really know all the biochemistry behind that sort of thing, but you, know, you don't want it too low. That, that it has some protective effect in terms of just balancing hormone levels and, and uh, you know, uh, but I, I, I can't really discuss that with any degree of authority. So. And then as far as the estradiol level goes, uh, hanging out with Caesar, Dr. Paul, Dr. Paul Reno, he actually, um, he, he feels that estrogen, which is true, is a, protects your heart. So I didn't, so really, again, I've been, I've been taught the basics with Bao T. That was my first introduction to hormone therapy, and it was, like I said, I know he dumbed it down for everybody, for lack of a better term. But like Caesar was saying, you know, estrogen's gonna protect you, so what's your take on that? Do you only, well, do you use a Remedex unless they have symptoms? I, in general, that's correct. Um, Neil Rizier will, pretty, he'll accept a, a estrogen of, in a male of 100, 110, you know, and then say, why, why are you treating it? Are you treating a lab value? But I've, I've, my observation is that there once, is one situation where it's clearly indicated, and that's if a guy has nipple tenderness or you get a little bit of gynecomastia. Um, and, um, you know, then you clearly want to treat it. But, but I generally don't want guys to even go there and, and uh, have that be a, a concern. And, and um, you know, and, and if the estradiol goes up a little bit, you know, sometimes it'll have a negative effect on their libido too. So I think, I don't necessarily just treat the lab value, but you know, if it's 90 and the guy says, I, you know, I have no nipple tenderness and my mood's fine, and my libido's fine, I say, okay, well, let's keep an eye on it. And maybe your testosterone's a little bit high. Let's, if you lower your testosterone just ever so slightly, probably the estradiol will come down substantially. So I'm, I'm, I'm really seeing now the art of testosterone, or uh, hormone replacement, because it's really clinical. I mean, right. whereas, it's funny because I was just, given the, I was given my rules, 5%, if it's over 5%, slam them on Arimidex. So then I'm reading my book by Doc Gordon and he's talking about all the bad side effects for Rimidex. Yeah. I basically had uh, my own hair transplant with Neograph. I got my finasteride on and basically he's telling me about how I need my DHT in my brain so I got myself off that. And right. I grabbed my, and in fact I put a Rimidex on a couple patients that had psych issues. So here I am, I'm giving them the t t testosterone to help their psych issues. They went over 5% with no nipple tenderness. I put them on a Rimidex and now I'm reading a month later that a Rimidex is going to make them worse psychologically. So I'm like, I just made this guy worse. That's the problem with a little bit of knowledge and it can totally confuse you. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it, and, and I see that situation all the time when it comes to hormonal issues and men, and even more so with women. Uh, it, it's, 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 it is an art and, and uh, the rules, I mean, most rules are me meant to be broken to a degree. I mean, because, you, you know, it, it depends on who's making the rules. I agree a thousand percent with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of implications to that. <laughs> so. but my big question is uh, your opinion on, um, again, I was taught first with the Bauti, which is backed up by evidence-based. It was all studies. The cardiovascular, my biggest question is I was taught that with all the different modalities, therapeutic options, that pellets, that modality, bioidentical, subcutaneous, with the capillaries wrapping around, gave you all the protection from cardiovascular disease, cancer, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. Well, it's, it's the same, same hormone, it's the it's same. But they had studies, and I gotta go back and see, they had studies that basically said that was his whole pitch. And again, Caesar's answer was, well, look who you were talking to. You're talking to a guy who's pushing, pushing pellets. I said, I understand that. I said, but there are studies behind it. Caesar basically said just what you said. I just want to make sure that that's, I want your guys' opinion on that. Because, yes, the intramuscular injections are affordable um, if they can tolerate it. Because, Pat, obviously, pellets cost, much, cost a lot more. I just want to make sure that I'm not sacrificing the cardioprotective effects, which is what I'm all about. Yeah which is what we're all about. Not, not in the least, and, and the, the cardioprotective effect is from your testosterone level and your estrogen level and all of these levels being at an optimal level. But, you know, I think that, I think that, um, I, I think that the, the, the protection is, is, is the hormone balance and it's just a quite, you know, 
the, the pellets are fine. I, I don't have any problem with pellets for, you know, in the right situations. People understand that they're going to have a crash at some point and they're going to want to get another pellet in there. Um, and that they will probably feel a little better that first month than they do that last month. Uh, and within normal range, well, that norm, it continues to go down. I mean, it's not this and that, you know, it, it goes down gradually. Um, so I just, and, and if you get a little too high or a little too low and you haven't crashed yet, you know, it's kind of like, now what, you know? But the, 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 I think probably the injections, because you know exactly where you are and you can change it week by week or almost day by day to a degree, uh, you know, uh, or biweekly, um, um, you know, you can change it within three days. Um, I think it's probably more cardioprotective because you're keeping this level very, very steady. And, and you can do a change within days. Um, there's no reason to think that an injection is going to be less protective than the pellets. And as far as the half-life goes, why, don't we why are we not just making twice weekly the standard? Because that's, my understanding is that it's the decline which can cause the aggressiveness as well, as well as well, the Yeah, initial. the, the labile nature of the whole thing. Um, I mean, I, I've, I have some people do twice a week, I don't, some do once a week, and, and yes, you get a little bit more of this uh, cycling with once a week, but not that much. I mean, you're, if you were to measure it, and, and it's been done, is that, you know, you get very little of that every other, I mean, twice a week. But after a week, maybe you're free, see, I, I, I mean, I, I know the numbers based, because it's, it's, I, whenever somebody has a blood test, I say, how many days after your blood test was your after your injection was your blood test. So if it's day one, I know that, uh, you know, if, say they're on 100 milligrams per week. If it's day one, their free T may be 230. And it's, it's day six, their free T may be, you know, 140. With, along so those it, lines, it, when do you tell them to get the blow work? Is it day six after their? I tell them, I like day three or four. So I like to get that kind of mid-level. mid, mid level. Now, if they're, if they're doing it twice a week, I'll tell them, do it day two or three because, you know, you're, they're injecting half the dosage and, and uh, you know, they're not going to get so much of a peak, you know, doing, you know, 50 milligrams twice a week sort of thing or, or so. So I, I, just, I just don't like to do it on the first day or the last day, but somewhere in the middle. But I just, I always ask them, oh, how many days was it? And then you can kind of extrapolate, um, you know, what your, what your levels are. But, um, you know, pellets, you, you don't have control over that. I'm not anti-pellet, you know, as I no, said. I so I'm, I'm not either. I mean, I've done, I've done pellets for the last two years. I mean, the convenience is there. I've also had pellets extracted. I mean, come out. I mean, that's a pain. That's a pain. Literally a pain in the ass. And then, yeah. I, I've, I've done both. I mean, your algae practice, I've done all of the above, actually. Yeah. And um, it's just that it's more my patients, the, the convenience is there. They feel better. Um, but I'm Again, I'm open-minded. I, I, I want to hear everybody's opinion, yeah. and then I'll make my own. I think if, in your practice, if somebody's on pellets and they're happy with pellets and they feel good and they have good results, no reason to change. New patients, I would, you can offer them both. Well, I mean, I'm ready for my next pellets, and I'm not going to do pellets. I'm actually going to do my injections so yeah. I can so I, I, I think that this is, this, is, this is part of the art and, and your relationship with the patients and, and their feedback to you and, and um, you know, my, you know, I, I, I did, I did pellets in my own urology office somewhat, you know, years ago, and, and but now I just basically got trained in, in the, you know, standard protocol of the injections, and I don't have anybody complain about the injections other than two people specifically that want me to do their injection or have their wife do their injection. That's it. You know. Can you go on the thigh? Yeah, you can. I, you, you, this I, I like this the best because you generally don't feel it much. The people that are heavier, anterior thigh, uh, anterior lateral thigh, works fine. I mean, it's obviously easier. I've done both myself. Um, I don't feel it in my butt unless I leave a little under the skin, in which I'll feel a little burning in the skin for, you know, 10 seconds. Um, anterior thigh, I've done that. But what I feel, it, for me, and everybody's different, I just feel a little ache there for an hour or so afterwards. Minor, it doesn't bother me, but it's like, you know, I, I, I notice something. Or if I do that and then I go out and exercise, it's like I, you know, I, I just, a little bit more sensitive there. And what are the symptoms you're looking for for, um, so it's a clinical, it's an art, so what, what am I looking for to see 
what are some of the red flags that we have to either go to twice daily or there's too much aggressiveness? You already said if we put them on too much, that's yeah. going to be right out of the chute. They're going to be aggressive um, within a day. Yeah, at, at 100 milligrams a week, I've I've uh, I've not seen that happen right away. I don't I don't see anything. Most people say, "Well, I, I did it now, feel anything?" I say, you're, "You're not expecting to see anything or feel anything." I, I've had, I don't know. I, th I think it's maybe. First of all, if if we're giving them the right dosages, the chances of that sort of thing are remote. You know, very small. Uh, it, it's when these guys get these crazy levels. They're giving themselves 200 milligrams every week, and their free tea is probably getting up to 500 or 600. You know, and, and they're, they're, you know, that's, which obviously your estradiol and DHT is going to go up too. Uh, I've had uh, maybe a couple or three different situations where a guy said, I just feel more anxious and I, you know, I, I, you know and, and he'll measure his level and maybe a little bit too high and I'll lower it. And, you know, if he feels anxiety with a free tea of a 240, then I may keep his free tea at 150, you know. It's part of the art, you know. I had uh, one uh, wife calling me saying, you know, my husband's getting too aggressive and he gets angry more than he did before. Um, so I ended up talking to her further and I talked to him further and it was, and she attributed it to the testosterone. I did his levels and the levels were reasonable and it, it really turned out it was more job stress or relationship stress and things like this, um, which she attributed to the testosterone, but as it turns out, I kept him on the same dosage and I, and I know this couple as friends and, and Two years later is nothing, you know, no problem. So it, it's it, it tends to be an issue when it's not being administered properly. So this has been a good discussion about that. Uh, yeah, keep going. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Neil Rousier wants your estradiol up because it's cardioprotective, and I agree with that. The only time I've used an aromatase inhibitor is when they have symptoms of more specifically brain fog or memory issues. And uh, once I was able to uh, get that below, say, 60 or even 50, the estradiol levels, then the brain fog went away. Uh, I think that's probably the only exception that I would use an aromatase inhibitor. Uh, I know some people are worried about gynecomastia and that's been a controversy because some say it doesn't really exist and some say it's a significant problem uh, and you should use an aromatase inhibitor but I think it's a trade-off for cardioprotective uh, qualities from the estradiol so that's one thing that uh, I think is important the other thing is I, I uh, have all my patients do twice uh, weekly uh, because I find there's less cyclical variability and uh, their mood is more stable and they're more stable. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's the gold standard. I, I, I have no problem with that. And so like Monday, Thursday? <laughs> Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Friday. Friday. I, I, I think that's, I, I can't say that, I, I have to say that's the best way to do it. You know, I, I can say for me personally, I've done it both ways. I personally don't notice a difference. Um, when I was doing it twice a week, uh, fine, you know, and uh, but then I started traveling a little bit more, and I'd say, well, you know, I don't want to carry this with me. I'm going to be back in a week, so I'd give, you know, do it once a week. And it's like, I, for me, it didn't make any difference at any point. I didn't feel any different on day seven than I did on day one. And, um, you know, I, I guess that it's a matter of uh, just logistical simplicity for some people. But um, I kind of give people the choice, you know. How do you feel? Do you feel different on day six than you did on day one? I think that's an excellent way to judge it, uh, to ask them how they feel. And uh, getting back to this aggressiveness, uh, I have seen that in really high doses, but I've also, just like you, seen it in uh, therapeutic doses. And um, when I do a little further questioning, because it's usually from the wife complaining, uh, it's not so much aggressiveness, it's just they're more assertive. And, uh, and before they were mild and whatever the wife said uh, they went along with, and now uh, there's a little pushback, and the wife's not happy about that. Uh, well, there's something we said for hypogonadism because you're safe in the harem, you know, and you can just kind of, you know, you, you don't mess with anybody, and you don't care, and you're depressed, and you just sit in the corner, you know. It's like maybe some women like that in their man, you know. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I guess that depends on the woman, but uh, it, to me, that's not a fun way to live, you know. <laughs> I'd rather uh, be just the other way, you know. 
So, all right, that was a 20 minute slide. That was very good, okay, next. Um, all right, so, so okay, so you got a 35 year old guy and he has no children and he's got a free test, he's got a total testosterone of uh, 400 and a free testosterone of uh, 50 or 60 and he wants to have more children. Um, now these are the guys, if they go to the low T clinics, they're gonna get testosterone here in Florida and probably in other places across the country. Uh, and then his fertility's gone down, uh, his own endogenous testosterone has gone down, endogenous production of testosterone has gone down, and uh, he may get softening of his testicles and uh, a lot of negative things can happen that you don't wanna see happen. Um, that's a serious mistake. That, that, that absolutely is, is, is just, uh, should be considered malpractice in my opinion. So there are times where you just should not give testosterone, but it happens all the time. But this is where you get the other options in terms of how to optimize uh, hormones. And HCG is a great way to do it. Uh, Clomid, uh, clomiphene citrate is another moderately good way to do it. And, and we'll talk about that. So as guys get older, even if you're not talking about the fertility issues, um, until they get probably in their 60s, I would, consider the option of HCG as a reasonable way of doing this. And, and there's certain advantages and certain disadvantages, but advantages of HCG. Um, the advantages of HCG is that first of all, you're stimulating your own endogenous production of testosterone. Um, and this may continue on and you may get great results uh, for, um, you know, Five years, ten years. I mean, it can be really quite uh, quite effective. HCG is an analog of LH, right? Yes, correct. Right. No. So you're working at the pituitary level, and you're stimulating, you know, human chorionic gonadotropin. And it raises LH and FSH. Um, so it, it it not only stimulates spermatogenesis, but it also stimulates um, the uh, growth of the Leydig cells and, and testicular uh, firmness. And one of the uh, frequent complications, no, well, not complications, but frequent complaints, well, infrequent complaints of, of testosterone therapy would be um, uh, testicular softening. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's because you're inhibiting the FSH LH uh, axis because when the higher testosterone, the lower your FSH and LH. Yes? Why would you, just on a theoretical basis, Sixty-five and a thirty-five, you're two men. Yeah. One you give uh, testosterone, the other one you would uh, give uh, HCG. Pretty much, that's fairly Very standard nice. for me. That would be pretty standard. Yes. Well, now, um, is there something wrong with uh, considering the um, HCG on the sixty-five-year-old man? No. Uh, th there's nothing wrong with that. You're not going to do any harm. There's there's two issues there, though. Uh, first of all, I'd say it's 50-50 chance it won't work because the older guy gets, the less likely that the HCG will stimulate their own endogenous testosterone because cause the problem is probably not then at the pituitary level. The problem then is probably at the uh, end organ level at the testicle. The Sertelli cells are just not producing, or the lighting cells are just not producing testosterone. Um, so, as much. Why, why wouldn't you it's consider? It's like ovarian failure. I mean, you, you, you can, you know, it's like menopause, and, and, it's, and it's an ovarian failure, probably not a pituitary failure, because women at menopause, FSHLA goes through the roof, uh, meaning the pituitary is trying to stimulate more ovarian function, but the same thing happens in men. You, you can tell, you, you can actually predict who's going to res respond uh, if that 65-year-old level. But in general, a guy who's 65 years old, most of the time his FSH and LH are gonna be moderately elevated, in, in which case you can pretty much tell in advance that if you boost it more with HCG or clomiphene citrate, uh, nothing much is gonna happen. Uh, so you can, you can judge that. Um, so, and, and, and I guess the other issue is most of the guys by the time they're 65, they're, they're not concerned about fertility. Um, they're thinking about simplicity, and HCG is more expensive, and HCG you have to keep refrigerated, and if you travel with it, you gotta keep it in a cooling pack and all that sort of thing. So, you know, it, testosterone is certainly simpler, and if all things equal, and you're not trying to have more children, and if the results of given HCG are kinda marginal, um, 
you know, there's probably not that much reason to use it. You know. Is there an age cutoff when you use ACG? Well, the 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 time where it's the, the the time where you could go either way, I would say within your 50s. And and if the guy's 55, I say, well, you know, we could use HCG and it may work for five years, and then we're, we're going to at some point, some point, going to need to give you testosterone because it won't work. You get into your 60s, it generally won't work well at all. Uh, but some, you know, some guys are fertile and have reasonable testosterone into their 60s, maybe 70s. So it depends. You know, I had two guys. Um, I had two guys. I just they were in their 30s and their testosterone those their 300s, and I put them on testosterone. So I've tried HCG first. I would. Well, if if they've had a vasectomy, and uh, they don't care, then I think you could go either way. But if they've not had a vasectomy, if they're even thinking about having more children, um, I would absolutely use the HCG first um, because. You don't know. I mean, you know, they say, well, we don't, we, I have two kids, I don't want any more. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I went through this with vasectomies, you know, where, you know, a guy doesn't care about his fertility. And I'd say 5% of these guys that I do a vasectomy on, if I do it when they're younger years and they got two kids, they, you know, they're going to come back five years later and say, you know what, I want my vasectomy reversed because their life circumstances changed. So it's kind of like that with testosterone, you know. And, and but if they want to have uh, kids later, What's the time if they stop the the testosterone? How, how it, fast? It, it recover? Sometimes it's irreversible. Many times it's not irreversible. And if you can't, in a younger guy who's concerned about his fertility, uh, get his his testosterone up enough with HCG, then I will treat him with both. And I'll do a lower dose of testosterone, get him feeling better. I will continue to give him a, a solid dose of HCG. The, to protect their testicle and protect their Leydig cells and Sertelli cells, so which will, you know, you'll still try to stimulate some of their own endogenous testosterone. You'll st still keep their spermatogenesis going, um, uh, but you're going to give them a, a somewhat smaller dose of the testosterone. That works fine because you, you can you can protect at the same time uh, using both. So that's a very reasonable option in that age group. What are the chances of um is it hard to get HCG through the insurance game? Mm, well, the whole insurance game is a different issue. I, I can't uh, comment on well, it. Is expensive? Well, it, it's not that bad. I mean, you know, I, it, it's uh, how much for it. It depends on what, what your dosage is. You know, I, what I would do, first of all, if I do it just for testicular protection, maybe a, a thousand or two thousand I use a week, you know, which isn't, doesn't cost that much. Um, what does it cost? I mean, I like to get 20,000 IU vials because then you can get some mileage out of this stuff. And a 20,000 IU vial of, of, of uh, HCG, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred dollars or something like that. But, you know, then that's, that's got a fair amount in it, you know. So maybe $80 a month rather than $40 a month, but affordable. Definitely. Yeah. So, um, When's the, when, you're, when are you checking the testosterone levels after that? I would probably check it about eight weeks, eight, 10, 12 weeks later. Um, just get a sense of what's, what's going on. And how do you determine this dose? Um, it once again depends upon, um, first of all, how, how much in a hurry they are to get response. Uh, how, uh, you know, it's, it's, it has to be affordable. The higher the dosage, the more the cost. Um, depend on their, their baseline level uh, of testosterone. Um, but in general, if I were to just kind of cookbook it, I would say I would, I would say start out with the 2,000 I use twice a week. It's sub-Q, it's not IM. Just do it anywhere abdominally. It's very simple, a little very fine 31 gauge needle, quarter inch 31 gauge needle. Um, and just do it twice a week and then see what happens. It, it, it would take two or three months before their testosterone is going to have a substantial rise. Um, but so I, you know, but how much, uh, what's the dosage? I mean, I've, I've, some men I'll just use a thousand I use once a week for just for testicular softening and maybe some protective effect in terms of spermatogenesis. Uh, some men I've yet to use like 3,000 I use twice a week, which is a salad dose, but that starts getting a little bit more expensive. Um, some men do 2,000 three times a week. But if you were to cookbook it, I would say start out at 2,000 twice a week and maybe then gradually increase it based on their response of uh, testosterone. And it's, it's, it's dose related to a degree. 
But if you take it as far as you can, I've gone as high as like 3,500 twice a week. So that's 7,000 I use a week. And if, it, if that doesn't do it, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. Are you, you know? checking LH and FSH with the testosterone? Well, I will check it first, you know, because if it's high f to start out with, you can tell this guy that, you know, you're maximally stimulated from your pituitary and your hypothalamus. You're, you're not going to get much happen. I can tell you that up front because, you know, if you give HCG and Clomid, you can tell the response by how much their LH and FSH go up. Um, at least you can predict the response. Uh, but if they're high to start out with, you know, they got it, you know, LH and FSH, it's like 9 or 10 or something like that. It, you're not going to get much response, you know. I mean, you, get, you give somebody testosterone, their LH and FSH go down to almost undetectable levels. So, you know, they, it, there's this feedback mechanism that's pretty direct, you know. Now, I'm 48, did the pellets, definitely saw testicular softness and shrinkage, which I could care less about. I mean, well. Yeah. Well, then, you know, if, if you cared, I would give 1,000 IU. I do that myself. I give 1,000 IUs once a week, sub-Q. It doesn't cost that much. I mean, you know, the 20,000 IU thing, it lasts 20 weeks. You know, it's, it lasts you almost half a year for one vial. And that's, that's what I do. I do 1,000 IUs once a week. And it dramatically changes things. I mean, I had testicular softening, and it's like, I don't know if I cared about it or not. Maybe I did, you know, and, but I, I do that a thousand. I, I mean, huh? I it. I mean, yeah, a thousand I use. It's like it's totally different. I mean, it's like it was when I was. You're dropping your dose of the testosterone. No, it, it, it has no effect on the testosterone. It, 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 a thousand once a week. No, well, I mean, maybe it would in a young man, but you know, it, 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 it what it does in me and men in my age is. is it will, the, the Leydig cells will still be stimulated by HCG, even though the Sertelli cells, which are producing a sperm cells, yeah. will not, I mean, the testosterone, you know, yeah. testosterone will not. So it almost, so it basically addresses the problem without affecting your, your T levels. So you're not going to adjust that No, no. It, it, it's, it's, it's not going to affect the T level so. at all, you know, um, so. Yes, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Uh, why wouldn't one consider clomide before you do anything? Uh, I would, and, and I'll get to that. Uh, that'll be the next topic here. Anything else so far? Yes. Yeah, so let's say you have a 35-year-old that you put on HCG to help with fertility issues and low T. Uh, do you plan on ever taking them off of HCG at some point? The younger person, yes. you say? <coughs> well, I would take them off when it no longer works. And it will not work once you get into your 60s. It simply won't work. Um, it's like ovarian failure. You, I mean, you, can, you can stimulate ovarian failure with a pituitary, you know, your, your FSH and LH can be 80, 90, you know, it can be through the roof. Your ovary's not going to do anything. And same thing with the testicle. You know, it's just, it's just not going to work. So. I've heard that also with patients on statins because it lowers cholesterol and it's very difficult to stimulate testosterone production in a low cholesterol state. I agree. I mean, testosterone is a is a is a is um, a derivative derivative of cholesterol. I mean, it all the whole cascade starts with cholesterol as the as the primary agent with a cascade for almost all hormones in the body. Um, so. You know, if your cholesterol is too, I mean, I, low cholesterol to me is dangerous, you know. Uh, high cholesterol is dangerous as well. But, you know, I think the cardiologists, and I don't know, you can comment on this and from the standpoint of internists, but, uh, you know, I, I think there's a sense that there's, uh, from the cardiology perspective, Caesar feels quite differently, by the way. But from, in general, from the cardiology standpoint, it's like there's no such thing as a LDL too low. You know, it's like you just get safer and safer for your heart. Um, but the problem is that, you know, your LDL goes down, your HDL goes down. It may or may not affect the triglycerides. Um, that seems to be an independent factor as I've seen it. Um, and the triglycerides are probably more of a risk factor anyway, I think. Uh, but the reality is that uh, there is clearly an association between, a, and I don't know why the cardiologists don't really acknowledge this, but they don't seem to. Um, but that there's an association with a cholesterol that's low with cognitive decline, a bit of brain fog, uh, potential liver dysfunction, and just feeling tired and a bad mood. And, and, and I've known numerous men, and this is after counseling with Caesar, getting his advice, that you take him out, and, and he, he makes it, you know, his, his comment is that, 
you know, if somebody's high risk and they have really high cholesterol, that, that's appropriate to give them a statin. But if people are not high risk and if their cholesterol is not, you know, at a really uh, um, substantial level that's, that's, that's problematic, what are you accomplishing? You're probably not decreasing the risk of a cardiac event and you are increasing the risk of, of perhaps cognitive issues, hepatic issues, and, and uh, you know, less energy, less or libido. More importantly, he told me, uh, or watch, watch the HDL. The HDL is high. I saw, him, I saw one patient he had whose HDL was 80, but her LDL was about 200, but he said, you're fine. And he said, because the HDL negates out the LDL. Yeah. That's true, uh, but, but on the other hand, you have to be, you, you, you know, you can do some genetic testing about what, how big is your LDL, because if you've got big LDLs, that, that's not so bad. If you've got little LDLs and a high little LDL, you know, and, and uh, that's, that's different. And, and you have to be careful that the high HDL is not an alcohol effect, and that may be protective, kind of, sort of. But you can get kind of an artificial elevation of the HDL from alcohol. But in my own anecdotal, now that I've been doing focusing on diet and exercise, I've seen it. It all circles back to diet, exercise, and lifestyle because that has been shown to get the small, even fix the small LDLs. And yeah. so there's other ways around it besides. So now my theory was it's, it's, yes, I've made that transition too. I was like the cardiologist, get LDL, LDL, LDL. Now it's like, okay, what's the HDL? And have we tried everything else first? Yeah. And nine out of ten, nine point nine out of ten times, we haven't. Not as docs, because because it takes time to talk about diet and exercise. Yep, it's easy for a pill, but we're all hammers looking for a nail, you know. And 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 it, tunnel vision is a is a problem. And I, I know that in years past, um, when I get an annual physical or whatever I'd happen to do, now I you know I don't play this game, but. I, I can titrate my blood pressure and my HDL based on how aggressive I am with exercise. I mean, I learned if I exercise a lot, I can bring my blood pressure down an extra 10 points, systolic and diastolic, and I can drive my HDL up a lot more within a month just knowing what I've done, it was just based on my exercise. Now, that was just kind of manipulating myself for an insurance examination, which is kind of a silly thing to do, but, but yeah, but, but I don't do that sort of thing now, but I just, I, you know, I, I try to follow my lifestyle pretty good most of the time, and I keep those numbers. My blood pressure has never been lower, my HDL has never been higher, and it works, you know, there's no doubt about that. And, and, and certainly, you know, hormone optimization magnifies the results of all of that stuff. Yeah, my uh, cardiologist tells me that statins have no effect on HDL. <sighs> it's not what I've seen, but, you know, you know, I, it's, it's cardiologists kind of <laughs> cardiologists seem to be in love with statins, you know. So they get a lot of free lunches too from <laughs> statin sellers, and these girls are usually pretty cute, you know. So yeah, the amount of ignorance that's out there, and you could put this on where where's the camera is ridiculous. How ignorant our colleagues are. It's 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 we've talked about this last night in some of the interactions I've had with my colleagues. But I mean, you have uh, the cardiology field is just with the exception of the Caesars of the world and these guys who think out, not even outside the box, they're just missing the boat. And I don't know if it's because that they now have to see a patient, they have to double their volume, and I know they're getting slashed with how much their reimbursement is for stress tests and everything else they do, but it's, it's really disheartening to see, like I'm almost, I've o I'm always wary of my patients going to see an endocrinologist. Now I'm actually feeling that way about the cardiologist. And I tell my patients, look, the cardiologist is just like, I'm, they're my mechanic. I just want to basically, they can, I, they're just doing a test that I can't do in the office. But that's it. Don't listen to what they say. I'll, let me get the report and I'll tell you what to well, do. Well, you know, with all due respect, um, you know, if, if you put somebody on a statin or you do some of these other therapeutic things, and if they have an event, then you've done everything you possibly can. But if you take them off the statin, even though you've not done anything deleterious and they have an event, it's all your fault, you know. Yep. And... It's kind of like if I put somebody on testosterone to get prostate cancer, it's, it's all my fault because I put them on testosterone, even though I know that their risk is unchanged. Uh, but you got to talk to somebody about that. And you can't do that in a seven minute talk, you know. But so if I have to talk to somebody, I mean, now I can spend all the time I want talking to somebody. But if I'm in my urology practice, I'm not going to offer testosterone to too many people because, first of all, I can't explain all that stuff in seven minutes. 
And if they have something happen five years down the road, it's all my fault, so I'm not going to do that. And I think the cardiologists feel the same way, and others feel the same way too. It's like you, you just, you, if you're going to get into any of these more progressive things that we're talking about here all day long, you can't do that with a seven minute conversation. You know, so I think that's why most of our colleagues are just afraid to go there. So. All right. Um, so the, um, I think one of these slides that come to the, uh, was going to come to Cloman. So in any event, we measure FSH. We've talked about most of these issues. The measure FSH and LH will uh, uh, predict uh, HCG effectiveness. If it's high, it's not going to work. If it's low, it's probably going to help. Um, next slide. Um, so here we go with clomiphene. Um, clomiphene has kind of an analogous effect to HCG. So why wouldn't we use clomiphene rather than HCG? Because it's a pill and it's, uh, it's uh, easy to do. You don't have to inject it twice a day. Clomiphene would be dosed either at 25 milligrams a day or 50 milligrams every other day. Um, and it will stimulate FSH and LH and sometimes increase your own endogenous produ production of testosterone. Um, my observation about Clomid, and I've used it quite a bit, um, is that um, the efficacy is perhaps 50% uh, in a younger guy um, and may work very well in terms of raising his testosterone in about 50% of the time. And I, I, I would use it in my urology practice more for infertility issues, but I found that it would raise their sperm count about 50% of the time. Um, in others, it wouldn't make any difference at all. And um, you know, the guys where it would really make some difference is if they have a varicocele and you do a varicocelectomy, and then you'll do clomid, and, and that will many times help their fertility issues. And secondarily, although at that point in my career I wasn't measuring testosterone levels much, but it secondarily will tend to raise their testosterone as well. But you have to think of it as a 50-50 issue. And it may raise it substantially, it may not. Uh, it may take you three or four months to d find out whether it will. Um, but those where it works, it's, it works great, no problem. Uh, it's just that you, you, it, it, the, if you think about efficacy, the efficacy of the HCG in a younger guy is going to be probably 80%, maybe 90% for a while until he gets older and he has end organ failure. Um, and uh, the Clomid may be 50%. Uh, 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 and then maybe if the coma doesn't work, then I would do the HCG. So, but most people don't complain about eight, the injections of HCG twice a week. Um, they usually want to get on with it, and uh, um, so I'll, I'll usually offer I'll offer both, but I'll just say that you're more likely to get a faster response with HCG. And, and most men will say, well, why don't we just do that? And, and the um, you know, but I, I've used Clomid plenty. So it's, it's, it's a reasonable option. People just have to know that I, it's, it's a little less likely to work. But if it works, it can work fine. What about a 65-year-old man? With a Clomid? I have not seen it do anything. And I've not seen it protect the testicle volume either. Um, so I've not really tried it in that age group. Because um, I don't think it'll have any effect on, on testosterone or spermatogenesis, probably at that point. Now, I don't have a lot of data on that. I've not done much of that. Um, but, um, you know, if it's 50-50 in a 30-year-old, you know, I think it's safe to say that the chances of it working are relatively small. And even HCG, where 90% it's going to work in a 30-year-old and a 10% chance it's going to work in a 65-year-old, then I think, uh, you know, at least Common sense tells me that I'm probably not going to get that much from the, the Clomid. That fair enough? Okay. Um, okay. All right. So I think we're getting near the uh, end of this. The uh, safety issues we've talked about, I think, uh, in in detail. Patient selection we've talked about. Um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, we want to screen men with the evaluations that we've been talking about uh, over the last day for a pre-existing cardiovascular disease. You want to screen with a PSA and a prostate examination. You don't want to start testosterone on somebody who has a prostate nodule that has a high PSA, has not had a biopsy. Uh, you, you really want to know where they are when they start and, and uh, because, uh, you know, you could potentially uh, um, 
maybe you're not going to make the disease worse, but you're certainly going to get criticized for doing this without identifying a problem up front. Uh, so any guy that has a high PSA or has a prostate nodule, I won't start on testosterone until I really evaluate him. And as, as a urologist, um, I would do uh, uh, prostate ultrasound, I do prostate biopsies and, and see where they are. And if they have a high PSA and a nodule and I've done biopsies and it's all okay and their PSA is stable, I, I would, it's fine to start them on testosterone um, if you want monitor them carefully. And, and same thing with cardiovascular disease. If somebody's got a high risk of cardiovascular disease, um, I would make sure that um, you've evaluated the stability of their cardiovascular disease because you start them on testosterone, three months later they have a cardiac event, it's, it's all your fault. Um, it's not all your fault and you've probably protected them, but it, you know, uh, that's, the, the, that's the way it's going to be looked at by your patient and by his attorneys. So I would establish cardiovascular stability. I would make sure that they've seen a cardiologist if there's any reason to be concerned about that. Um, cardiologists use testosterone a moderate amount too, so I mean I think cardiologists have figured out that the testosterone is a reasonable um, well, protective effect. Research, so why are we screening them? Uh, why are we, why is cardiovascular disease a contraindication when testosterone well, protects them? Contraindication, I, I'm just saying I would want to know somebody's cardiovascular status before I start them on testosterone because if they were to have an event and I start them on testosterone, there's been data in the literature, very little, but you know, if, if you have 50 articles that are saying it's protective, you know, there are two articles out there, this VA study that's saying it will increase your risk of a cardiovascular event, you know, I would want to know that just to protect against those two articles that will be in your face by some litigious attorney because you started on testosterone and they had a heart attack three months later. Uh, and so so it's, it's really a, it's, it's a defensive medicine and sort of issue, but it's a, it's, a, it's a significant issue. And if you're concerned about cardiovascular disease, just make sure that they're screened. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell people that, you know, m maybe, maybe there's some increased risk. If you are still smoking and you still have other risk factors and you're hypertensive and, and you're not doing the right things to protect yourself, and I start you on testosterone and then you're getting perhaps a little more vascular pliability, and this is certainly analogous in women, and we'll get into that soon. Uh, where there maybe you could make a case that there's some increased risk those first few months as you're going from a vascular structure that's uh, more rigid to something that's more pliable, you flip a plaque and things like that. I, I think that that's people that are doing the right lifestyle that are at real risk, I've, I've never seen that be an issue. And I think ultimately in the long run you're very, this has a very protective effect. But in a short run, you know, you could, you could make some relatively loose case that there's some short-term risk. Have you ever been called as an as a, as a expert witness in anything like this? Uh, not yet, but if I had a problem, I'd call Neil Ruzier, <laughs> you know. Say, come on, Neil. But I'm sure he gets in that situation a lot. He's, he's been high profile, so he's, he, he does a lot of, but you know, you know, you spend four years in court playing this game, you want to be protective as best you can, you know. Yeah, I, I have uh, many patients who have pretty severe cardiovascular disease who I've started on testosterone and I've seen nothing but improvement. Right. I, I I'm find exactly the same thing. I, I think it's dramatically protective. I mean really dramatically protective. But, you know, there are two articles out there, that VA study, that, you know, if somebody wants to come after you, they're gonna wave that in your face, you know. But but that's a different issue. I, I'm not I'm not you know, saying we should be practicing defensive medicine, but I'm just saying that uh, know where their status is. You know, you're doing them a favor, you know, in terms of just make sure that they have, a, they can have cardiovascular disease, but it's, you know, make sure they don't have unstable angina, you know, that they have, that they're being followed. So. <coughs> uh, but then the same thing with exercise, too. I mean, you know, we, we just want to make sure that we're being sensible as good doctors on all fronts, you know. Uh, does that satisfy you? You're comfortable with that? Yeah, I, I would say um, with patients with cardiovascular disease, I like to monitor their EKG during a VO2 max. I agree. I agree. Some equipment will do that and some won't. You know, the core doesn't do that. The uh, others that do, but it costs more. But uh, I, I agree with that entirely. So. 
Um, okay, next. We've talked about this. Um, keep going, Paul. Um, so I think we've kind of covered the bases on all of this. Uh, right patient, uh, good nutrition, proper exercise, uh, uh, keep an eye on their labs on a regular basis. Uh, make sure you've uh, done a good medical history and physical examination and continue to monitor them with physical examinations and uh, lab work on a regular basis. And what else, Paul? I think we covered that well. That was great conversation here and good, good uh, give and take on all this stuff.